Good evening, everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the little slideshow. We're waiting for all of the attendees to come in. So now we're ready to start. I'm Carrie Fox. I'm the Deputy Director of Marketing and Earned Revenue. And on behalf of everyone here at the New Children's Museum, I wanna thank you for coming. We are so excited to start this new Artist Talk series because it's an opportunity for us to share with all of you who we are and what it is that makes us unique in the world of children's museums. Uh, we commission contemporary artists to create full-scale, room-size, immersive and interactive playscapes uh, for children. And uh, not too many children's museums uh, worldwide are doing what we do. So during these artist talks, our curatorial team will be interviewing and uh, having conversations with our commissioned artists about their art, um, their practice, and the work they're gonna be doing for us this year. So um, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, this series is made possible by the Rainhouse Circle, which are donors at $1,000 and up who make it possible for us to commission contemporary artists and bring in new installations as well as care for and conserve our current installations. So we wanna thank them for that. Um, secondly, we do have all of the attendees muted, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. There's a couple of different ways you can talk to us throughout the evening. There's a Q&A where you can put questions. Uh, there's a few of us behind the scenes, Megan Dickerson, our director of exhibitions and Tammy Gamboa, our director of events and myself. We'll be going through the questions. If we can answer them ourselves, we'll answer them directly. We'll also be sharing them with our moderator to talk with Katie. Um, you can also put uh, comments in the chat and you could chat directly to the panelists or to the panelists and all of the attendees. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Tomoko Kuda. I'm gonna have Tomoko come on screen. Uh, Tomoko is our deputy director responsible for all things curatorial, our exhibitions, our installations, our programming, and of course, our work with commissioned artists. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tomoko. Thank you. Um, we need to unmute. Right. Harry, thank you so much. You know, we are really, really excited about this evening's event because it is the beginning of an exciting 2021. I think most of you know that the New Children's Museum remains closed and we're coming up to about a year. It's been a tough year, but it's also been a year in which we've been able to reach out and find new artists for us to work with, new commissions. And we're really, really hopeful that as San Diego's um, you know, COVID situation improves, we'll be able to open in the spring. So um, tonight's talk features Katie Ruiz. We have been able to commission her to create a beautiful mural so tonight's talk is um, a little bit about um, reimagining welcome and how she's going to do that, do that for us through a beautiful uh, painting that's an adaptation of a brand new illustrated children's book, which I might add um, is also really, really wonderful for adults to read. It's not just, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a full in-depth look at the life cycle. It's beautiful. It's called Brian the Wildflower. And then she's also a sculptor. Um, so we will learn more about that. So working in 3D um, will be a very unique spin on the mural she's creating for us. So, well, I think we'll jump into the conversation. Um, Katie, we can see you now. And I know you're at home in your studio, surrounded by incredible artwork. So with that, um, love to have you jump in, um, introduce yourself a little bit. And I know you've prepared a really wonderful selection of artwork from your career and your portfolio to share. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. It's so nice to get to work with the Children's Museum and do something with a different sort of twist than I've ever thought about before. But at the same time, I wrote and illustrated a children's book. So it was the perfect time to uh, get to work with you guys. And I'm just so grateful that uh, you chose me to do this really exciting project. Um, and, you know, you and I had met back at my mm -hmm. colorful show with another artist named April Rose. I'm going to just start sharing my screen here if I can. Can everybody see that? Or no? Yes. yes. A large. Um, so that show at Mesa College with uh, curator Alessandra Moctezuma, you came and we got to talk and that was very much a very rainbow-esque show, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which we were 
uh, got the got the wheels really spinning. Um, but I thought I would go way back and start more at the beginning and let everyone know what led us all the way to this point um, from the beginning of my work. Well, not the beginning. The beginning is starting at grad school. This is grad school 2015, um, which is uh, really, I was a figure painter. I've always been a figure painter. Um, and that school really gave me the foundation for painting the figure eight hours a day from a live model. Uh, this drawing was, well, four hours drawing and four hours painting. So um, pretty exciting stuff. You can see that it's actually made of a bunch of pieces of paper that were added together. So really thinking about the composition and the forms and the space at the same time, um, as well as being in New York City really paved the way for me to figure out my art career and uh, that I did want to pursue this full time and um, New York City was a really good place to spend four years doing that. Um, so there's a lot of details. Uh, feel free to jump in at any moment. Um, and maybe I should back up just a little. Well, actually, we'll go forward and then we'll back up when we get to the right painting. So uh, these are just a few examples of some of my older work, which is charcoal on paper, really just studying the figure, really getting a grasp on drawing as the foundation for everything that I do. Um, and that school really did uh, push that method as uh, and you know, I give it credit because I am a workhorse as is, but, uh, you know, they really trained us to be painters, painters, and really the foundations, uh, kind of old school, um, but something I needed to learn. So um, I also did a lot of portraiture and I just, you know, I love color. I love form. I mean, just learning um, about paint at this point. Uh, just practicing how to paint and trying to make things look as real as possible. Um, this is the first time I ever made a blanket painting and it's more of a drawing really, but it was a gigantic rolled piece of paper from one of those drawing classes with those pieces of paper. And at the end, a lot of people would throw away a, a lot mm. of their work or they would be flying home, for example, so mm. they couldn't take it. So. I would pull all the paper out of the trash because I had no money <laughs> and I gessoed this up and painted uh, new figures on it. And I used uh, this interesting color pattern, which starts becoming very mm -hmm. eminent in my work with the hot pinks and then with dark colors and mixing it with earth tones. Um, and I really derived that from my travels living in Mexico, in Guanajuato, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I had picked up some blankets on my travels. And yeah, so these colors, um, just keep a note in your head because we'll see how this sort of unfolds, unfolds yeah. as we go into this. Yeah. And Katie, you know, I, I have the, um, the very, you know, fortunate, um, you know, circumstance of having heard your about your travels and about the blanket series. So I'm, I'm just so excited for the audience to learn about this because it's such an interesting way to think about how you landed to create this new mural. You know, it's just this really great trajectory in your life. So yeah, please do share. Yes, I have done a whole lot of traveling in my life. I did semester at sea at the age of 18 years old and um, semester at sea is university on a ship. It was through the University of Pittsburgh when I went. I think it's through a different university now, but I didn't go to University of Pittsburgh, but I did uh, spend three months traveling around the world on a ship and we went to 10 different countries. Um, should I name them? <laughs> I went to, I'll do it quick. <laughs> sure. Japan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Thailand, India, Tanzania, South Africa, Brazil, and Cuba. That's quite a range. Um, yeah, because like uh, and we started in we started in Canada. Mm. So I, yeah, I there was different versions of the trip that would do more of Europe or do more of the southern. So I want always cared to go to Africa. I always cared mm. to go to India and Mexico. Um, honestly, because I was attracted to the colorful textiles and the culture 
uh, always, even as a child, I would flip through National Geographic. So that was also how I learned to draw. I copied National Geographic photographs. Um, anyway, so these blankets, um, this, it wasn't even from a blanket quite yet. This was actually from a printed picture frame that I had, an embroidered picture frame. Um, and I'm, this is the first time I throw a blanket completely over the figure. And I love that idea. Uh, I love the idea of, uh, this one's called safe under here. So they're feeling safe under the blanket warm, but we use blankets for a lot of things. We, um, uh, some cultures bury their loved ones in them, you know, kids make tents out of them. Um, there's a million things that we do with blankets, embroider stories into them. Um, so this is uh, one of the first blanket paintings I did, and it's from an actual blanket from my travels living in Guanajuato, Mexico. And I did that in 2004 after semester at sea which was 2003 and i i went to printmaking school there i did uh lithography and linoleum cuts and uh some other things at the university of guanajuato but i also purchased this blanket which was in my studio at the time because i am known as a napper in my <laughs> studio <laughs> That's and um, oh yes, all my studio mates will all tell you that I'm a pro 20 minute napper. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I love these bright colors going together with the browns and I always thought those color patterns were interesting. So completely covering the figure, which abstracts it, which was surprising that people then were like, oh, that looks like me and my boyfriend or me and my girlfriend or me and my child, whatever, you know, um, everybody could see themselves in the work. So I really liked that about it, about putting the blanket over the people as well as I liked how it connected them. And this one is called communication because it looks like, you know, the blanket is helping them communicate. Mm -hmm. And this blanket is from India and, um, yeah, it's an interesting blanket. I still have all the blankets. I collect them all. So uh, this one is from India. And this is the first time I started painting these animals and birds and uh, different sort of narrative on the blanket rather than just dealing with the stripes and the colors mm -hmm. and a little bit of pattern. So that's interesting. Kate. Do you mind if I ask a little bit about, you know, the animals, the pattern? Is this you creating a pattern for this blanket? And no, a new story. This is a hundred percent copying the blanket. And I had my friends, uh, I threw the blanket over them, uh, my studio mates, and took some pictures and made them stand there. And <laughs> um, then I painted it pretty directly. Um, and you can see in this, in these few, there's not a lot of background happening yet. It's just more of the couples. Um, but I'm sort of developing that as it goes on. So this one, no, I was really just trying to think of different blankets that I had and how that reflected back sort of into my life and, you know, um, my travels and just a love for textiles. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then th this one really did uh, blow open the story for me. I started, you know, I've, I'm sure you, most people have seen these beautiful Otomi textiles, which are Latin American, Mexican textiles, uh, but they all, they go down further into Central America. Mm. And they're made of uh, little pieces of different colored embroidery, and they are depicting animals that they believe came from cave paintings, which I think is really interesting. The idea that these could be fantastical animals that were made up. Um, maybe they existed and we haven't found their skeletons yet. I don't know, but you know, there's a whole lot of theories that could go into what these animals and bugs are that look different than the ones we have today, obviously. We know they're colorful and fantastical, but uh, they're depicting narrative. There's often humans, animals, thing interacting, uh, depicting daily life of the culture and the people. And I just was just swept away by the detail 
and the colorful combinations that just seem so wrong kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> and also right you know but training wise um you know you don't necessarily want to put a brown next to a pink uh or so to speak um yeah it's interesting so, but i really like their these choices yeah katie i'm getting beginning to get a few questions in the q a and so i'll, I'll start asking some of those um so you've talked a lot about these blankets you know the iconography the color and all that what is there something specific about the blanket? So this is the question in the Q&A. Is there something specific that draws your attention to the blankets? Uh, I or is think, it all these you know, things I, in the beginning, I was traveling and why did I choose to mm. buy blankets on my mm. travels? And I also bought pieces of material so that I could make a larger quilt out of all of them. Um, my grandma, grandmas have both been avid crocheters and knitters and worked in fabricas to make daily money for the funds to live our lives and sewing constantly. Um, it's always just been something I've done. I did a lot of uh, crafting as a kid and sewing and knitting myself. So mm -hmm. I think um, I've always just been attracted to blankets. I think I'm just attracted to aesthetics, but I also, think that Mexican blankets in specific because of the color combinations, those bright stripy rainbow ones, I was, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted one and then I got one and then it got stolen and then I got mm -hmm. another one and then I got another one and now I have too many blankets. But, um, you know, I think everybody has, uh, it could, it could be, it could have been a, something else, you know, mm -hmm. it could have been. Um, well, it's quite a souvenir to bring home. Yeah, it, it took it, a it, lot it, of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't, so I don't know, I guess I, and I also will say that I was living in New York City. Mm. I was alone. It was cold as mm. heck. And I spent a lot of time under my blankets. So that mm. first one was about a relationship that wasn't really going somewhere, but you know, the blankets sort of holding it together and then, um, you know, the second one is more of like a mother and children and thinking about a mother keeping her kids warm. Uh, so I think a lot of those things came into play. And I also had been a figure painter for so long and I wanted to have the figure in the painting. I did not want to be an abstract painter, but I wanted to abstract the form in new ways that were exciting. That's great. Katie, you've mentioned Mexico a few times. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your background? Because, you know, one can make an assumption looking at your name, <laughs> but that doesn't give the full story. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely uh, intersectional is my word of the year. Um, and I do, I do live even looking like I could be white passing and also like I could be partially Latina or whatever people feel like they wanna see is really what they see. Uh, but I am half Mexican. My father is from Tijuana. He was born there because my grandma was cleaning houses every day and coming across the border so that she could buy five green cards in like 1959, mm. I think. And uh, then they came here with the green cards and made their life here in LA. And my mom is a wonderful Caucasian lady from Chicago and um, with some Irish and English ancestry, although I really do want to do my DNA um, because I, you know, a lot of people are quite shocked and I think that could really take me in another direction too, if I know exactly my uh, DNA. So that's on the list um, to, to be determined. That's really interesting. Yeah. 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 A lot of um, cultural influence in your work. Yeah, and uh, I, th I think the other day, some I think I think you were asking something about, um, you know, thank you for being inter intersectional or, or being able to be that. And I thought, you know, I don't even know how not to be, and that's mm -hmm. how I'm able to, I think, be more open minded um, right. with a lot of what I do because I do see I do live in a with a lot of privilege 
And I also live with plenty of racism um, in different right. ways. Right. So it's an interesting place to be. And I feel like, okay, this is uh, who I am. We're going to make art about it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to um, try to help people understand what actually goes on at the border and um, you know, who these people are and what, what it means to be sort of a border town in San Diego as we are as well and TJ. Right. So back to the painting, we have uh, some landscape finally. I put a little bit of water and I start thinking, well, where are these people? What are they doing? So nature starts interacting with them. Um, sometimes they're close and holding hands. Sometimes they're fighting and pulling apart. And so all of this is with the blanket connection. Um, and then here, uh, Love this so, one. thank you. This piece went to the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, their auction. Um, so it's living in a beautiful home somewhere in New York actually. And this is uh, one of the first times I think I do a single person. Again, I'm living in New York, I'm cold and I'm alone. And it's, <laughs> so it's called Winter is Coming. And, um, but the birds have now come off the blanket here. Uh, so we start to see these forms and animals that I'm creating come to life. Um, and sometimes I'm making up the patterns. There's a whole bunch more blanket patterns you can look up my website at katieruizart.com and I'm sure they can plug it into the chat box. Um, but there's a lot of patterns I make up and that some that I find online and others that I actually buy the blanket. But mm -hmm. at some point I couldn't buy every blanket I was painting. Um, there's some really great um, chat messages and thank you um, for putting up Katie's website information. Yeah, because we did get a question um, separately about you know how to look at more of your work and um, possibly inquire about purchasing if there's interest in that. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a website and you can email me directly. And I also have an online archive of my work that's available so we can direct people who are interested to that as well. Uh, so, and most of these are 60 by 48 inches, um, these pieces we've been looking at. So then I go to Oaxaca in pursuit of blankets and learning more about blankets because what I start to realize is that all of these blankets are not just beautiful patterns, but they are also telling stories. And each symbol is let, allowing the weaver to weave the narrative of their life or their town or whatever story that they wanna tell. So I spent a month with an elder in Oaxaca who taught me traditional backstrap mm -hmm. weaving. Um, and this is it. It took me all month to make this one little piece and it's backstrap because it goes around your back and then you strap it to a tree. So it's only as wide as, as you are because you can't make it wider than the tension. Wow. Um, so it's a really interesting, beautiful process, <laughs> very slow. And um, each one of these is a symbol. So at the top there, the crisscross one is lightning and then mountains and the colorful lines are ribs and then they're, and it's upside down, sorry. Uh, the next one is women carrying water and then there's corn and then rain um, and more mountains. So uh, that was really something that I took home and I thought, okay, now I have all this yarn and I have all of these symbols and all of this narrative on top of narrative because mm. there's the people what are they doing where are they the blanket what's on the pattern and what story is the pattern on the blanket telling um and then i just say ha huh. this is great yeah <laughs> it's like every, oh. every it's free <laughs> Yeah, at the same time I went to the to Oaxaca, I had also lost my father and he died at a young age of 62 or four um, from liver failure because he's a pretty bad alcoholic. So I was actually painting in LA. I had moved home from New York, went to Oaxaca and I was, this piece is really about letting go of what no longer serves you. You know, when something drastic happens, you realize, ah, 
this is important and this is not right. So there's me really letting that pattern mm. go. Um, and it's not specific symbols. That's really from a Moroccan blanket, but um, it's a, a different way of dealing with the narrative. Mm. Um, so this one, um, after I moved to San Diego and I've been in San Diego for a few years, I uh, met Lauren Siri, who gave me a show at 1805 Gallery in Little Italy. And I called the show Chicana, which is uh, what I am. It's a mixed Mexican American person, um, which was a word that I hadn't really known of very much before because I did grow up in Prescott, Arizona, which was, we didn't have like Chicano studies or anything like that. Um, so I wasn't aware. I didn't even know there was a Chicana. I didn't know that I was one until I knew. And so I was really excited once I was like, oh, because I didn't feel comfortable saying I'm Mexican because I'm not born in, Me I'm not a Mexican. I'm also not completely Caucasian. So when I found this word, I thought, aha, this is great. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, and it pretty much epitomizes who I am. And that's what this painting is as well. It's mixture of American, Disney, you know, we love Mickey Mouse. I grew up with Mickey Mouse. This is actually a family vintage blanket. Um, and then the Otomi symbols are there, but they're completely different. They're symbols of me. They're things of, um, that represent who I am and they're coming out of the blanket. Um, so it's showing all parts of you, you know, sometimes the blanket you're trying to hide, you're trying to mm. keep warm, or you're trying to be vulnerable with someone. Mm. So this one's really about identity and using those symbols yeah. um, to show the mixture. It, it's really interesting. You're, you're revealing so much about yourself as you talk about your work, you know, as you say, identity and, and the, the blending of two very strong and distinct cultures here. Um, and I think I mentioned in, in a different um, conversation, how I'm, I'm also seeing like a mixing of time, you know, mm. Disney, all that, you know, very contemporary, whereas Otomi symbolism has existed for generations. And, you know, it's just a longer um, backstory there. That's really interesting. And then there's this living plant, right? So it's, <laughs> like, it's all alive. It's, it's still all mixing and coming together. Yeah, definitely old and new is something I'm really interested, in, especially as, um, you know, old textiles are considered craft and women's work. And, um, you know, these artists are not signing their work. They're considered artisans. Um, and those backstrap looms are the oldest uh, loom ever found. So I believe it started in the Philippines and I don't know how they got to Oaxaca, but some mm. of the oldest looms in the world is that type of weaving. So yeah, I think it's really, I like the idea of taking something traditional and putting a contemporary twist on it. Mm. And, and from what I understand, uh, backstrap um, weaving, you're using your body, right? In the, in the making process, right? So yeah, so you have it tied to a tree, like a million strings like this, and then you pull up and you pass it through and you mm. pull down. Yeah, it's very, they do it also like with their knees bent underneath them. So sitting on your knees, basically, which mm -hmm. um, took a little getting used to. It took a wow. lot of getting used to, but um, yeah, it's very strenuous on your body. It's hard work. Yeah. Uh, and I also love how repetitive it is. It's pretty good for you know, my paintings are very rapid and into it. And then the weaving is slow, slow. You know, mm -hmm. I work for three hours and have an inch. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I know how fast you work in painting because I've been watching you, you on the mural. So that, that is truly amazing. And speaking of painting, there's a question in the chat. Um, are you using acrylics or are you using oils in your paintings? These are all oil paintings. Uh, I do put some encaustic wax in them, so they do get pretty matte. I don't really like a shiny look on my paintings. Um, so you can see there's quite a bit of thickness there. And I've been an oil painter and a 
only an oil painter until mm. I recently started doing more murals and found the gold and open acrylics, these acrylics that don't dry as fast and you're able to really blend for a lot longer. So now that there's some alternatives in acrylic, it is possible for me to move to acrylic, but I'm very traditional in that sense. I also just really love the smell of oil paint yes. and I oh, love yeah. the colors or yeah. I, I just, yeah. it's, it's just, it, it is what it, it is. Yeah. It's I know what you mean. For me. Yeah. <laughs> It's great. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's see. Okay. So um, now these guys, these um, rainbow creatures start coming off and really flying around, zooming around, and you can see a lot more movement. There's more featheriness. And I start realizing they don't have to be the exact pattern of the Otomi animals. I can sort of, um, you know, make it again here's another example of contemporary with traditional so i'm still trying to honor the otomi animals and really acknowledge these beautiful things as well as sort of bring in my own elements that are chicana and um are old and new and um also these interesting color combinations that i have a lot of fun putting together um, so yeah, and this one is, I you, you can see because this one's pretty small and it's large that I use a lot of palette knife. So I'm sort of scraping through mm -hmm. on some of these and then I did the brushwork as well. Mm -hmm. um, and here's a bunch of examples of uh, me now creating this rainbow world. Um, and I call that guy in the top left corner rainbow man. And um, these are very dreamy they are meditative they are sort of from my psyche i was learning about artist um agnes pelton at the same time she's a de desert transcendentalist mm -hmm. everyone should know her california desert scenes are fantastic um and uh so i was really sort of trying to meditate these paintings out. I call them automatic painting where you kind of don't have a plan and you just let it flow out of you. And this is what flowed out of me. Um, and it was really fun to just let these things sort of come out and finally release my attachment to those exact animals and just say, hey, yeah. I can make my own rainbow world. Yeah. I watched a lot of Rainbow Bright as a child. I see that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I almost see like um, textile patterning, you know, in the way you're moving, you know, the colors across the canvas. Yeah. 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 Well, and this one is again using the traditional animals and bugs and then also incorporating my um, portrait. It's, mm -hmm. it's probably my face. Uh, people ask me that all the time. And I, I, you know, I think they're all self portraits in a way. Um, I can't really get get away from that. It, it's it's about being Chicano. So how is it that yeah. <laughs> self portrait? Um, but this is actually probably one of my favorite paintings. I think it's for sale on Artsy right now um, through Catherine Fosnot Gallery. Anyway, this piece is the combining the old and the new again, and really bringing to life my own new rainbow type of world although i don't want to call it rainbow world maybe it's called chroma world because this piece is called chroma temple and this is where we really start um i say we as if i'm more than one person i start uh blending instead of making those harsh color changes and really playing with making up my own plants and animals and um, just using symbols from that are contemporary and symbols that are ancient. So this is the first time um, that you start seeing this blending technique, which comes into play here as well. And this blue, um, also again, the colors going back to the Mexican blue color. I really like uh, La Casa Azul. Frida Kahlo's house. So that was the inspiration for this color. And, you know, the animals in this one are traditional, but they're, they're painted contemporary. Mm. Um, and 
also. As I was weaving in Oaxaca, I came home with yarn and I started making pom-poms and I started making tassels and I started making fiber sculptures because I had all of this yarn, but the weavings <laughs> took a little too long for me to actually commit to. Um, and I really liked the idea of mixing my painting and my textile. So these pieces are really about um, having the two sort of marry each other. Again, it's a combine. It is two things. And I guess that's my thing, um, you know, painting and sculpture or textile and painting that need each other um, and that work together to make this beautiful combine, yeah. Yeah. which is Rauschenberg's term, but I like to call it combinas. That's great. Well, it's also you too, right? So the Mexican, the American. Yeah. Right. That is, uh, you know, if you say it in the Spanish version, um, feminine. Yeah, so combines. Yeah. This one is probably my favorite one of the combines. The painting has to need the sculpture as much as the sculpture needs the painting. And I'm uh, using playful things like an embroidery hoop and some rope. And uh, I think that's a placemat, a little woven placemat. Um, but I am mixing the two again, old and new, and I really, I don't want to give either one up. Someone told me recently that I didn't really need the yarn stuff anymore. It was like, you don't need that. And I, and I do, it is, um, it, it's part of who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. So, um, to each his own, but yeah, so this piece and this idea, you know, it also really, this is me breaking free from all of my own rules. And that is a lot of what I do. Um, people, the person who asked why blankets, it could have been anything. It's about being in pursuit of something um, and really going down that rabbit hole. And that's what I love to do. I think art is interesting because it's an endless set of questions and answers, right? So, you know, I could have gone a million directions with this material, but it's what you choose to use and then how you choose to use it and asking yourself questions along the way. So, to the then I made a whole bunch of puffy art. Um, <laughs> so much fun this is how i got my th through pandemic yeah. was just yeah, making was really joyful yeah. playful thank goodness you didn't give up the you know <laughs> the mixing and the fibers with the painting yeah. yeah yeah so i thought people would think these were ridiculous and people love them they resonate mm -hmm. with people and you know they're tactile and they're puffy and they're pretty and they're pink and they're also um, you know, fancy materials and cheap materials. Um, I used to be a makeup artist. So I have like some fake hair braids in there. And then I also have uh, another material I picked up in Oaxaca, which is uh, agave fibers. It's called mm. Ixtle. So they look the same though. You know, it's like plastic fake hair and then this beautiful agave fiber um, but I'm just having a blast in my studio and trying to survive the pandemic. And what was really great is that I didn't have anything coming up because there was nothing going on. There was, you know, all shows were canceled. And I think it opened me up to just make what I needed to make. Um, right. uh, this, this is- To our benefit, right? Yeah. This yeah. is a close up of home, uh, which is, uh, the beginning of this pom-pom situation and I again I thought people were gonna laugh this plate this piece out of the art show and instead people cried I could not believe mm. it and I love that it resonated with people and they're like oh this feels like home and then um the city of San Diego ended up um acquiring this piece recently so hopefully That's they'll right. put it up somewhere permanently right. for people and is that is that embroidery in the center? That's an embroidery. So I started sourcing embroidery that my grandma would give me or just things I'd find at Goodwill or at estate sales. Um, and I would incorporate those into the weavings as well.
And then I made a 1200 <laughs> piece. This is great. This is just so great. So yeah. then I thought, let's go big. And um, the Oceanside Museum invited me to create a pom-pom project. And it's uh, 25 feet long by nine feet long. And they will put it back up in June for Pride mm -hmm. Month. Um, it was supposed to be with a big party, but you know, we couldn't do that. And we had to switch gears and make pom-poms at home. And it worked out really well and it was really fun. And we made this huge community pom-pom project. And um, yeah, there's a picture of all of the pom, well, not all of them, that's some of the pom-poms unloading. Um, and so it took about 1200 pom-poms and it took about, I think three months, three to six months of actually making pom-poms and then maybe three to four months making the pom-poms and then stringing them all together that's so great that is my I, adorable little niece <laughs> and katie is it okay if i just share um we'll provide more information later but the museum is going to take on its own pom-pom project in support of your mural with the 3d elements of the pom-pom so um, we hope you know everyone who's on this zoom tonight will be able to participate by making some pom-poms yes so you guys get to make pom-poms at home. Luckily, it's a great project to make at home with your kids or while you're watching Netflix or listening to a podcast. It's relaxing. It's fun. Um, and so these pom-poms came to me from all over the country, actually. Uh, they mm -hmm. live in Ohio, so they sent them. So anybody can participate, and it's not... Um, it's not hard and you'll probably want to keep making pom-poms because it's really fun. Uh, I also, um, and we're going to put this all together at the end, I also wrote uh, and illustrated a children's book called Brian the Wildflower, which I wrote about five years ago on a plane ride home. Um, and it's about uh, my past boyfriend who uh he passed away when I was very young and when he was very young I was 20 and he was 25 and um yeah he passed away in a tragic canoe accident and it really shaped who I was that's when I went to Mexico the first time and um did the printmaking and um it really did change who I am but it allowed me to create this beautiful book to help um, everybody really um, mm -hmm. understand the life cycle and um, you know the, just the redistribution and the interconnectedness of bugs and worms and dirt and this uh, you know gentle yeah. quick beautiful life of a wildflower yeah and I thought Katie was particularly poignant because this year has been very difficult for many people. Many people have lost people, you know, due to COVID and you know various other things. And you just framed the story of birth to death, you know, and passing, um, in such a beautiful and understandable way for children and and just all people. As I said earlier, you know, it's it's really an inspiring book. So I highly recommend um, everyone. You know, getting themselves a copy, taking a look, and and do you mind if I do a little plug? Of course, <laughs> yes, please. So the the book is available through the museum's online store, and Katie, um, you let me know that it's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Yes, um, and yes, thank you. I I'm really glad that it came out now. Uh, I it took me five years to get it done for a reason. And it took me until pandemic to say, okay, I have all the files, let's do this, let's figure this out. Uh, so it really, it really, I, it really does make me happy that it helps people, um, you know, move through those hard times and help kids. And I really did write it because I was a nanny for many, many years and I read a whole lot of children's books. And I didn't find a lot of children's books that helped children grieve or helped them understand um, a point of view other than, you know, a heaven, earth, whatever view, you know, there's a whole lot of ways to deal with this topic. And I just wanted to make it something that kids could understand a beautiful story, whether they understand all parts of it yet. Um, 
but they will. And I think the adults get to have a whole, uh, I've seen a lot of adults get teary over the book. So I really, I really think it's um, something um, that everyone should read. Uh, this is just a little detailed page from the book of Brian the Wildflower. And the reason that we're showing these couple of images from the book is because the mural and the bugs and the Otomi animals, they all came together in this final work of art that is the mural that we are working on, I am working on right now at the museum. So this is so beautiful. This yeah. is Brian the Wildflower and all the worms, bugs, dirt, Otomi, rainbow you could dream of. Plus we're adding, ready for it? Drum roll, da, 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 <laughs> a pom-pom party on top. <laughs> <laughs> this is really spectacular, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and hearing the story behind all of this, right, just adds so much more depth. It's gonna be, you know, visually stimulating and so exciting for kids and, and, and you know, the narrative, it's, it's just great. And the interactive piece with um, the pom-pom making. And this isn't the only part, um, this is not the full mural, there's so much more. I mean, Katie, you, you really have been working so hard <laughs> and so fast and we are so blessed. Um, to have been able to, you know, meet you and then be able to move forward on this project. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah, my goodness. Do you want to share a little bit about the blue? Because this this blue is stunning and you had a special story about it. Um, well, uh, I want. I really wanted a blue that looked like La Casa Azul and they act, they don't, they do make a paint that is called that, but it's in another country and you can't get it. So we were looking and looking and I came across an article that the scientists have actually found a whole new blue. They've come up and it's the brightest blue. I've, it's cobalt on fluorescent. <laughs> it's, it's the wild. It looks like this. Um, this blue is pretty, pretty much it. It is. But this is computer blue. This was drawn on the iPad. So um, this color is, it's a really beautiful color and it really is a very traditional Latino color as well. Um, but it's so interesting that they keep finding new elements and mm. are able to find a new natural blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And blue is a tough color to make out of natural elements. Oh yeah. yeah. Especially this, this bright. I'm yeah. getting a couple questions about your, um, your technique as an artist. Um, you mentioned oils as your preferred sort of painting uh, medium and now maybe some acrylics on canvas. Um, are your, your are what look like watercolors, are they indeed watercolors? Those are watercolors behind me. Um, I do not discriminate with my materials. I love them all. And I will use whatever material suits me and I used to keep myself in a box and I thought I had to be a painter and I thought I had to be a figure painter and I don't. Um, I can be a pom-pom, yarn, sculptor, oil painter, acrylic um, and I you know I used to teach watercolor and I do love uh, little landscapes in watercolor actually the top one there with the blue, that's uh, from life. I just go around neighborhoods. That's like a real blossom and paint things. So, um, you know, I want watercolor because it's quick and easy and it helps me do my medium, uh, however, to get the message out. So these are some little watercolors that I was doodling out my ideas. And then I also did some of the doodling on an iPad. Mm. Um, I took pictures of the watercolors and then I drew on top of them in the iPad. Um, and all of Brian the Wildflower are drawings and watercolors as well. So I really, I just love paint. Um, and it has to be, it really has to be paint that you can reactivate or re-blend. So oil, I can blend a long time. Watercolor, you can reactivate it and blend. Not mm -hmm. after it's dry, but, mm -hmm. well, so that's not really the rule. But yeah, basically I'll use anything that's colorful and wonderful. That's great. <laughs> There's another question that I'm getting about the mural for the museum. Um, was your creation process any different for this artwork since it's more three-dimensional than other ones you showed during the presentation? And what about the space inspired you? Um, I, I like this question. I've been, I have not 
had a museum say to me, Katie, do whatever you want. <laughs> and, and you guys kept saying that to me. And I was like, well, can I do this? But can yes. I do that? And it was the most exciting feeling. Um, and I've always had a little note in my studio that said, give me a museum and I'll fill it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you guys have sort of given me that opportunity. We just kept expanding and expanding and expanding. Well, yeah. and it was great, honestly, right now, because the museum's closed, we were able to have long talks in the space. Right. right. Um, and, you know, the wall and the spaces were already empty. So it was easy to visualize it. And um, mm -hmm. it really came to life with some conversations. And um, also this one, you know, it is so much my style, it's so much who I am, and it's so much for a children's museum at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I love all of that about yeah. the piece too. Do you mind showing the one with the pom-poms one more time? Yeah. Yeah, so everyone can take a look. And I want to point out um, the clouds up above where the pom pom, where the pom pom rain, you know, we sometimes talk about it that way, um, are descending from. Um, it's, it's just so beautiful. It really fills the space nicely. And, you know, I think kids are going to really enjoy learning about it, looking at it, discovering, you know, all the different animals, all the different colors looking up and getting the surprise of the pom-poms yeah it's and I love, I love the raindrops uh it, it's first of all they're really fun to paint but there's so much with these little bits of color that are adding up to this giant thing and i think that's what is the otomi is about as well it's all these little, little bits of colorful that add up and you know it can be busy but it's not it's in a very um structured way and I'm just really excited about this piece. I'm, I'm having a blast making it. And I just, it was so fun to get to, it's, in a, it's really whatever I do next will have something to do with this because obviously everything keeps going to the next thing. So it's, it's really interesting to see what will go, keep going after this. So it's so nice to have these beautiful, um, not only the mural, but to actually have the pom-pom aspect as yeah. well and combine them. This is the first time actually on a large scale that they're being combined, so. Yeah, yeah this is so unique for us. We are, we are so blessed. Um, we've already rolled into the Q&A, so I hope people will keep um, <laughs> asking questions. Katie, thank you so much you know, yeah. for, for fielding all this um, information. Um, yeah, the, the mural is stunning. I cannot wait until we can open the museum um, later this spring and invite people in to you know, check it out. It's gonna be really great. In the meantime, we've been taking a lot of photographs of Katie, just so um, the group knows. Um, and sometimes you're painting you know, with a big brush, sometimes you're up on a cherry, you know, cherry picker you know, on a lift, um, way up off the ground, painting up um, you know, close to the ceiling. It's yeah, impressive. it's really it's really nice though to paint painting inside. Um, indoor murals are always, you know, <laughs> so much better than the wind and the heat and the rain. So it's it's really really nice to be painting in there. I got a question a while ago, um, wondering about whether you have a favorite Otomi character, figure, animal. Um, this is let's see. I can show him. Whoop. Can you see it? <laughs> yes. This guy is, uh, I'm Looks not like going to say it. Yeah, it's a it's Quetzalcoatl, I believe. Is, I'm probably um, messing it up. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a whole lot of different animals and they have different stories. And they have a lot of uh, historical um, different, I, different um, meanings that are for different gods, et cetera. So this one is actually one of the gods. Um, and I do, I am starting to um, make up my own animals, as we said. But I think the original ones I was really drawn to were the flower and butterfly ones. Mm -hmm. I was really more into the butterflies at first, but then I really liked the deers and um there's this weird duck one that has a long neck <laughs> i don't know what it is but it's great um 
They're, they're bizarre. They look like multiple animals put together. So as you know, I'm, I'm learning, oh my gosh, look at what they've done here. They've put a duck on a horse's body, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so they're having fun and that allowed me to open up and create more of my own animals. That's great. Here's another question for you. It seems as though your creations are an evolution of color and textiles, but is there any one thing that inspires you as you create or design? Um, absolutely. So I think um, one thing that we didn't really touch too much upon, but which is becoming more and more evident in my work is a politi political aspect. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of being Chicana is very much about, uh, you know, rights for BIPOC people. It's also very much about women and craft and women's work, like I talked about. So that really becomes a political message. Um, but right now I'm really thinking a lot about the border because I'm reading the book Borderlands. And um, so my work is addressing myself as a Chicana woman and what that means as an intersectional woman living at the border um, with white privilege, with uh, also Mexican heritage and all of those things. So in essence, I think it is political just being who I am. And it's uh, the message um, is always really, um, it has to do with my own femininity and it has to do with women and making sure that uh, all sides of the story are sort of being told here. Mm, yeah, that's really great. That's really great. I mean, it, it's a dimension that, you know, if we only look at your, say your, your children's book or perhaps think of you as you know, creating something in the children's museum, not realize that there's so much more behind what drives you to be an artist and to share your message. Yeah, that's really great, it's really great. Well, everyone, we have come up to seven o'clock. Um, we're not quite done. We've got a few more special things planned for the evening. So I'm gonna invite back my colleague, Carrie, and she, we will transition to that. Uh, we have two upcoming talks, so please uh, be on the lookout for invitations. We've got um, David Reynoso and Wes Sam Bruce. Um, we're going to be doing these monthly, so we have one in April and one in May. Um, and then just a reminder uh, that we have invited the Rainhouse Circle and our board of directors to stay on after for uh, a private chat with the artists. So thank you again, everyone who came. We greatly appreciate all of your support and um, Look for an email from us. You can share some of your thoughts about tonight's talk and we'll definitely incorporate that into our upcoming talks. So That's thank great. you again. And I'm just gonna add a little bit there. There were some follow-ups. So um, I think we've captured um, some email addresses and some additional questions and resources to send out. So please stay tuned. Yeah, and it was recorded so you can also watch this again. Um, all right, so thank you so much. And, thank uh, you.